here it comes. The epic, gorgeous, beautiful Walt Disney World monorail cruising the skies above Epcot. That is a sight that I look forward to seeing. So much so that I just sat here for like, I don't know, 15 minutes or something waiting for it. And what is this, you ask? It's the Sometimes Vlog. Yeah, yeah. It's a vlog that happens sometimes and sometimes every squirrel, squirrel distraction. We got a squirrel distraction here. A squirrel distraction. Sometimes it happens at Epcot. Look at that squirrel, very unconcerned about me. What's he digging for? What's he trying to get? This is the first sometimes vlog starring a squirrel, but this is no ordinary squirrel. This is an Epcot squirrel who cares nothing about us or what we're doing. Looks like he's searching for his buried treasure in there. Who knows? Maybe he's trying to find some popcorn. Pretty crazy. Anyway, sometimes this vlog happens at Epcot. And I was just thinking back right now, back to all those years when I first started coming to Walt Disney World, where Epcot was really like almost the forgotten park. You know, it was the oldest of the parks other than Magic Kingdom. It had been sort of the least upgraded in a long time because you had Animal Kingdom over there with exciting new developments. You had Hollywood Studios with its roller coasters. And then over here at Epcot, it just sort of felt like a lot of leftover 80s stuff. And then, you know, the World Showcase and people just sort of used that as their like, uh, I don't know, their drinking area or something like that at Walt Disney World. There were just a number, maybe I'm wrong, but that was the perception that I had was it was just sort of the like, eh, Epcot, you can go over there for a little while, maybe get a little enjoyment out of it. And I was thinking back to all the vlogs that I filmed and all the hours that I spent in this park after, you know, cruising around at other parks, especially at night, I come over to Epcot and it would just be kind of empty except during food and wine and stuff like that except during the festivals it'd be kind of empty and now epcot has got so much going on so much construction it's got the new rides i'm thinking of epcot pre-frozen pretty much pre-frozen once frozen came into the world showcase it was like a whole new generation of families and people were like you know what we haven't been to epcot let's go over to Ep let's check out epcot you know and um gave them something to do in the World Showcase when it comes to new modern Disney rides or Disney characters for kids. They introduced more and more of the sort of modern Disney character theming to it. It had all been sort of pretty much just Epcot themed, 80s themed. Maybe you'd see a little bit of figment here and there, but that was about it. So I really feel like things have been taken up a notch at Epcot and also the 35th anniversary of Epcot didn't hurt now of course you got Epcot's 40th anniversary and Epcot has just become a completely different place than the sort of kind of wandering around didn't feel like there was that much to do you know so what a wonderful world and what a wonderful change I've always loved Epcot ever since I first set foot in Epcot I was like what and the heck is this strange part? I think I'm just at that right age. I was born in 83, so I was born a year after Epcot opened, but I'm just at that right age, that, that sort of retro 80s futurism. By the time, you know, the rest of the world was catching up to Epcot style and technology, I was a little kid, five or six, and I could remember, you know, that kind of Optim the 80s optimistic future, the weird Reagan era future going into the Bush years, into the Clinton years and all that kind of stuff. So Epcot just felt magical to me, like a place that I would have loved as a kid and never made it to until I was an adult. So it was like walking into a weird, like almost like a childhood fantasy or dream or something that you wish you could have seen when you were a kid. So different experience from all the kids that grew up going to Epcot, which either by that time were like, nostalgically devoted to Epcot or like eh, boring kind of old old hat you know I want to see some new stuff um, but it's definitely been revitalized with all of this new stuff and particularly I credit that to Frozen I think a lot of people would get angry no Frozen ruined everything it replaced Maelstrom the cool old Viking ride over there in Norway but I think I would give Frozen a lot of credit for rejuvenating Epcot and making at least making Disney sort of get excited about Epcot, care more about Epcot, and clearly invest a lot more money into Epcot. And is it me, I'd have to look it up to be sure, but is it me, or do the festivals come 
like thicker and faster now, right? You had food and wine. You'd sort of hear about flower and garden, which is coming up. That's why you see all these beautiful flowers here at Epcot and these giant topiaries of which we will see a lot more as we make our way around the world because that's where we're going. But uh, it used to feel like they were much farther apart. Flower and garden and all that kind of, now you got Festival of the Arts right into Flower and Garden, right into Question Mark. You know, I'm usually not here in the dead of summer to be fair. Uh, and then by the time I come back in the fall, you are right back to food and wine. Then food and wine feels like it goes right into Festival of the Arts. No, it goes right into Christmas and then that goes right into Festival of the Arts again. And so it feels like this endless cycle of festivals and it keeps it pretty darn busy out here on the World Showcase. Look at that, Spaceship Earth. Now, my loose plan right now is I've got a little extra time this morning and I was just thinking about taking a jaunt around the world. But of course, it's me. I get distracted by every little thing. Look at the little Olaf statue right here. Who do we have over here? Ah, we got some characters over here. These are those 50th anniversary little statue characters. And uh, we're missing the, the most popular one, of course, is the Coco one over here. Oh, let's go see Olaf. At least here he is. Look at that. There he is. This is the guy that brought all of those kids and kind of a lot of adults back over to Epcot. I think it's my theory that he brought a lot of traffic back over to Epcot and got people re-excited about, wow, look at that view of Spaceship Earth, and got people kind of re-excited about Epcot, like, oh yeah, you know what, Epcot is fun, and there is something to take the kids on and all that kind of stuff. And then with the festivals, just one after another, it just feels busier, more vibrant, more like a place to be, and less like a place to be only during food and wine or at night, where a lot of adults would come over at night. But during the daytime, I can remember walking through Epcot and thinking, Man, what a ghost town, what a shame, because it's so well themed. And uh, it's funny I say ghost town because today is the most ghost town like I have seen it since I've been here, but it is before noon. So too early for people to come drinking around the world. And we are right between festivals. The Festival of the Arts ended a couple days after I landed here. I'm not sure when Flower and Garden begins. I didn't even bother looking this time because I won't be here, but uh, it's coming soon, obviously, because you can see they're setting everything up. Hopefully they don't put real bees in here. We don't want any bees, bees, bees everywhere. We don't want that. We don't want anybody getting stung. You know what, I haven't been stung by a bee since I was about, oh, I just saw one of those Epcot birds chase off a little blackbird right there. I've never seen them be, be competitive or territorial like that. I don't think I've been stung by a bee since I was about four years old. I stepped on what I thought was a dead bee not that I stepped on it on purpose, just that I saw this bee that I thought was dead. I wasn't thinking, da, 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 and I walked right back down the stairs on that same step. Ooh, National Honey Board. Looks like there's gonna be some sweet sticky treats over here in just a little bit. Anyway, stepped on it, got stung, because it was obviously alive and struggling. It was in its death throes, I guess. And uh, that's the only time I can remember ever being stung by a bee. Allie has a crazy story, and I always get it mixed up, because there's two stories of bees near her, but I think she had one where she was running, like, you know when you have to run the mile in school, and a bee got stuck in her hair, I think, and she was trying to get it out or something, it stung her hand, some crazy story like that, or maybe it's one time a bee stung her hand, and another time one got stuck in her hair and freaked her out that she was going to get, so she's been stung a lot more recently than me, but uh, yeah, I have not been stung by a bee ever since then, and so people will ask you sometimes, like, well, are you allergic to bees? And I, I have no idea because don't can't that change you know as you get older couldn't you suddenly become allergic to bees so i don't know i'm always out in the desert i'm always out in weird places or like central california the orchards or all these different spots where i see beehives all the time and i'm out in the middle of nowhere so bees are coming up to investigate me actually once i was at joshua tree national park a very different environment from the environment that we're in today where Obviously, it's very, uh, by the way, if you can't tell, it's very sticky and moist out here. Every single person you are seeing, if you were to get close enough to them with the naked eye, you would notice a glisten. Everyone is glistening out here. I actually cut the sleeves off of this jacket yesterday. I was wearing the jacket to keep the sun off of me for this reason. I don't know if you can tell, I'm a little bit red right there. Normally, I'm a very dark shade of brown as a human, as the skin tone uh, type of thing and I, never, I don't burn. I'm just like, that's my superpower. You know, I'm normally a nice dark shade of walnut or whatever it is. <laughs> dark shade of walnut, I don't know. Anyway, I'm normally pretty darn brown, pretty darn golden brown. And uh, as I go out in the sun, I just get darker and darker and darker until, you know, I pretty much, you know, am just, I don't know, like really dark brown. Like, uh, 
Anyway, you've seen, you've seen over the years if you watch any of my videos, but COVID and the past couple of years, even the adventures I went on this summer, I really tried to avoid the sun a lot, probably because during COVID I got the palest I have ever, this is the palest I have ever, ever been in my life. I haven't seen myself this pale since like high school or something like that, or maybe the years where I was really sick, celiac disease was undiagnosed, I was inside all the time. And, uh, and so I know that that first trip out of the house in winter to Florida, regardless, even without the COVID years and the trying to avoid the sun, I tend to burn on the top of my arm. So I was trying to wear the jacket, trying to wear the sleeves. And finally yesterday, the humidity caught up with Florida. It came back home to roost and it was like, this is impossible. So I went down to Walmart. I had also forgotten my sunglasses. I had to buy some ugly Mickey Mouse sunglasses. Luckily I found my real sunglasses today and uh, I cut the sleeves off my jacket and I actually busted out the shorts. So I've been wearing jeans and everything. I finally busted out the shorts. So luckily I have one pair of shorts left. I am unsupplied. I am not prepared for Florida. It was a year and a half between my last visit to Florida and the first visit of this year when I went and filmed the final day of Splash Mountain. If you guys missed that, go back and check it out. But it was a year and a half, so 15, 15 months, I think. So not quite a year and a half, but pretty close. 15 months uh, since I had been out here. And dude, I was, well, it was winter time, so I didn't need any summer clothes. So that's that story, that thought finished. But I was unprepared. I was unprepared for the walking. I was unprepared for just Florida, the magnitude of Disney World, switching parks and all that. Okay, look at this. We are in delightful, beautiful Canada, where there are ice storms and sleet and snow and hail. Actually, we were hanging out, my friends and I that I'm here with, we were hanging out with a Canadian author named Blake Northcott. She works for like Heavy Metal Magazine. She's written a couple of books. Um, which I have, but have not yet read. Um, it's really nice. She's from Canada, and she got a big kick out of just how weird this was, and how and she's obviously from she's like from Toronto or something like that. And you obviously have a lot of British Columbia, Northwest Canada influence over here in the front. Then you've got you know Victoria over there or Vancouver Island with the uh, with the botanical gardens area. If you weren't aware, and that's they're from actual real uh, gardens, and then you go more into the more eastern Canada this way, and then you go into the fancy steakhouse and all that. But definitely in Epcot, the main thrust of Canada seems to be this northwestern section over here, and you have this giant totem pole. Now this giant totem pole in particular, I'm not sure about these two smaller ones, and I'll tell you why, but this giant totem pole was carved, where is it, where is it, where is it, hunting, hunt, there, oh, it's over my shoulder. Did it move? Did it move? Is it trying to sneak up on me? This giant totem pole right here was carved by my good friend, Leroy Schmaltz, that's the Oceanic Arts Tiki Carver guy. And uh, there's a pretty funny story about that giant tiki. Um, and I had thought that he had carved these other ones too in my memory, that's how it worked. But uh, Adam DeWoo and I were over here a couple weeks ago and we were noticing this totem pole was hand carved by Simshin artist David Boxley, so a Native American artist over here. Now I know Leroy often carved out designs designed by or in conjunction with Native American tribes, so I'm not sure if he worked on these two smaller ones, but that giant one, I know for a fact, he carved out at Oceanic Arts in Whittier, and their shop, the outside portion where he had to work on this thing was a giant chainsaw was uh, right out along a busy street. So he's out there hacking away at it, literally with a hatchet. And so some, some part of this totem pole he's working on with a hatchet and uh, yes. So <laughs> this is funny because the way I got this story, sorry, I am all over the place, but it's early in the morning right now for me. I was up very late, we're up very early. It's before noon. I haven't started drinking around the world yet, I promise, I'm just very tired. But he was telling me, because I went, oh, you know, Leroy's 60 years in the business, and Leroy sadly passed away last year. But right before that, you know, I'm like, man, 60 years in the business carving tiki's and totem poles and signs, like I guarantee you he probably carved this particular sign, looks very Leroy-ish to me. And I go, you still got all 10 fingers. And he goes, well, there's a story there. I got pretty close to losing one one time and it was for Epcot and it was for this giant totem pole which is now completely backlit in silhouette. Let's walk around the other side. It was for this giant totem pole. So Leroy's got a hatchet which is basically an ax 
head on a little shorter stick like that. He's chopping away at this totem pole, some part of it, and somebody was driving by and honked their horn, hey, Leroy, and he looked up, and just as he looked up, he had his hand down on it, chop right down like on the, I can't gesticulate because I'm holding the camera, but right down sort of on this area right here, like on the thumb area, thumb almost came off. He's like, uh-oh, calls his daughter. His daughter had to come and get him because he was working late by himself. There wasn't a lot of other guys around at the shop and had to come over and take him to the hospital. And luckily they saved his thumb and he obviously he kept his thumb uh, into a ripe old age and lived a very good life, Leroy. But yeah, this right here, I was like, oh, so Epcot cost you some blood, Leroy. He's like, oh yeah. That was a painful one. And he told me that every time he ever saw pictures of this, or even when they came to the giant installation, that all he gets a little pain in the hand, like, oh, dang, I got my, uh, my thumb almost lost right there. So someone almost lost a thumb for you guys to be entertained by this giant totem pole right there. Now that, that is impressive. That is blood, sweat, and tears. And yes, it was designed in conjunction or in consultation with um, some Northwest Canadian tribes and, uh, well, First Nations people, actually, as the Canadians would put it. And let's peek inside of Canada. Let's just, let's, it's one of those places we can peek inside. It's always awkward to peek inside Canada because it's never busy. People always walk in here and sometimes this is completely empty, but let's just take a peek, see what we can see. I was like, oh, I doubt Canada sells much merch because it's always warm here. Not always, sometimes it's very cold here. And then they must do a brisk, but brief business. Um, but all the stuff in here is warm. Got the warm PJs, the spirit jerseys, the hoodies, the long sleeves, and the thick flannel pajamas. But yeah, that was the main thing Blake was talking about. It was like, you know, not everything in Canada is plaid. And I'm like, yes, it is, Blake. Yes, it is. And there are moose, and there are mounties. And she's like, well, yeah, yeah in some places. And then um, lots of the stuff in here is maple, right? So you'll have, well, these are coffee crisps. and. But oh, even right here, here's some maple syrup right there. You have a lot of maple products and a lot of maple leaves on stuff. Well, oh, that's cute right there. Look at that. My dad's Canadian. Maybe I'll get that for him. Uh, lots of uh, just maple leaf stuff. I was like, not everything we eat is maple. Yes, it is, Blake. Yes, it is. So uh, yeah, my dad is actually born in Canada. So for you Canadians, he was born in... I want to say Hamilton, but he was born over near Toronto. I got a lot of family over in that area around, just between sort of Simcoe up to Kitchener, down to Toronto, uh, mostly kind of around the Brantford area. Oh, look, everybody's getting a fun group pick in front of Canada. Oh, drink number one. So they must be doing the drinking around the world thing. And they have chosen to start with Canada, which we also have, which is unusual. I thought it was going against the flow. Normally, I start with Mexico. Anyway, yeah, my dad's Canadian. He moved to Saskatchewan as a teenager. His parents got divorced. And his mom, with my Canadian grandparents, uh, she, she, they had moved to California when she was young. So she went back to California. And he sort of went back and forth between parents until sadly his dad, my grandpa passed away before I was born, only a couple years before I was born. That kind of forced my dad to move to Southern California where his mom was at. And thus he met my mom in high school and I was born. So sometimes I think like, man, it's really sad. I never got to meet my grandpa. And he, you know, I was three years away or something like that from, from, from him getting to see me and me getting to see him. And then I realized like, had he lived, I never would have met him because I never would have existed. It's a weird little back to the future kind of thing. I don't know if my dad's ever thought about that. I wouldn't bring it up to him, but uh, it's yeah, I wonder if he's ever thought about that. Like, well, you know, if I could have traded that accident, not happening uh, as my grandpa sadly passed away, drowning, always wear a life vest. Uh, he was on a lake canoeing, sudden storm came up, wasn't a great strong swimmer. What are you gonna do? So that's why they make you wear the dorky life vest. The dorky life vest can save your life. Always wear the life vest. But anyways, um, personally, I don't like wearing the life vest, but I'm a much stronger swimmer, I think. But also I know that I should. So whenever you're on a boat and they're like, you have to wear this life vest, okay. I think about it and I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. Okay, so anyway, um, it's one of those things like, would you trade the tragedy for your future kids, you know, like, oh, what a crazy thing. I doubt he thinks about this, but I think about this all the time. Well, I thought about it a lot when I got, went through a divorce, which is a real fun thing to go through. Never go through it if you can avoid it. Wait and make sure. That's my advice to everybody. Wait and make sure, and mostly, the number one thing you wanna make sure of is that someone's around you for a very long time 
and they still like you. And make sure that they liked you a lot to begin with, because if you're the chaser and you kind of convince, you know, okay, yeah, I guess we can make that work. Uh, you might find out 11, 10 years later that uh, they didn't like you all that much in the beginning, and it took them five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, and they're like, you know what? I, yeah, I, I definitely was right in the first instinct. I didn't really like you, so wait and make sure somebody actually likes you and enjoy your <laughs> enjoys your company before you make a lifetime commitment with them. But I always think, would I trade going through the horrors that I went through? No, because then I wouldn't have you know my son. I wouldn't have my life. I wouldn't be where I am today. Now, had you asked me right when it was all going down and the heartbreak and the tragedy and the family break, I was like, I would have never gone through this. I wish I could do it over and just never do it and all that stuff. But with time comes a little bit of healing, a little bit of perspective, and you realize maybe my grandpa, my other grandpa, my mom's dad, used to always say, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for, everything happens for a reason. Well, maybe he's right. I don't know that that's true. I don't know that we're living like the secret and we put vibes out in the universe and get them back. And I don't know that there's an all controlling force because we don't talk about religion here. So even if I had a crazy opinion, I wouldn't give it to you. I'll just let you guess. But, but I don't know, maybe it's true because with a little time, a little perspective, well, a lot of time and a lot of perspective, I think, yeah, I'm glad that I went, I wouldn't trade it. I'm glad that I went through what I went through because at least I'm over here on this side and I've experienced so many things, seen so many things, done so many things and known so many people. I never would have known. I never would have known my buddy that I'm here at Walt Disney World with. I never would have known my friends like fake Tyler and all those people. I never would have met Allie and I never would have had this whole different life. There never would have been a sometimes vlog. Random Land was already started, but uh, a certain person that I'm not around anymore hated random land and so what if uh what if that had never because i was like the punk rock guy in a punk rock band and i remember like really being tired of the band and all that stuff i had started the random land thing and it, she just like did not think that was cool like ugh. so you went from like rock star punk rock front man to making weird disneyland videos and remember that was not a thing that was not a thing at all nobody was doing that kind of stuff back then so what I say it was the original, not at all. My, you know, I had several friends who were kind of dabbling in that stuff. Like Adam had done his famous Disney dozen videos and then got banned from Walt Disney World for a while. And he had done one or two at Disneyland, but it was one of the early ones. Uh, he had him and Tim. So you got to keep in mind, this was not a career path of any kind. This was not like today where you could go, I want to do that. Maybe I can make a lot of money. And some people have made a lot of money, not me. Not me, not you, not me, but some people. Um, it wasn't like that. It was like, what are you doing? You're doing some weird loser, nerd Disney stuff. And pre-60th anniversary of Disneyland, being a Diz nerd wasn't like a funny, cute thing to put in your bio. If you were like a Disney nerd or Disney parks nerd or you're a grown up that wanted to go to Disney, people were like, what, really? You know what I mean? So it was a different time and it wasn't that long ago as the trippy part. Oh, look at, here we go. Here's a little fairy garden over here. For flowering garden. My mom loves fairy garden stuff. I did an old sometimes vlog with Allie where we went to M&M Nursery in Orange, California. It's a good place to get fairy garden supplies. They have whole pre-built fairy gardens you can buy. Actually, look at that. And there's the number one fairy herself, Tinkerbell. I do believe in fairies, I do. All right, we're already 20 minutes into this and I am just down two countries. The World Showcase here at Epcot is 11 countries, 11 pavilions representing 11 different countries. And you could kind of put asterisks on that because there is like an Africa area over there. Is that a 12th country? Because Africa is a continent and sort of a hodgepodge. It's just a refreshment stand and a little wood carver. Does that count? Does that not count? There were hefty big plans. And I heard this from multiple sources people in the company in all different levels, not just like friends who were uh, sweepers or worked at a restaurant or something like that. I heard from some people who would, who would know that there were serious blue sky plans to put Brazil over here or over here, uh, but to come up with a Brazil pavilion and finally add a new country to Epcot to the point that what I heard, what I, I can't verify this 100%, but I believe the people who told me that there were actually posters and artwork ready to go to um, for the big announcement, which would have been at D23, the same time they announced the Mary Poppins ride, 
and the Moana stuff at Epcot and all those big changes that they were going up until the last second, supposedly, they were going to announce Brazil. And that rumor had spread far and wide. It's not just me that heard it. And to the point where so many people came, uh, Disney World people came out to that D23 to cover it because they thought we're going to get this huge well they knew they were going to get big epcot announcements anyway but mostly everyone was excited like well we're going to get brazil and that is partially because there are a lot of brazilian visitors to walt disney world i don't know if a lot of californian people know this but there's a time of year and it's around now uh i think their winter right in brazil where they come up here to disney world in like massive massive numbers so there are weeks and time actually when we first got here we were sort of in a brazilian wave and i'm not sure exactly what all the different times of year are but there are times of year where that's the closest part to them to fly up from brazil to florida it's not that bad so they come up here to experience this as kind of their home disney park and you'll see lots of brazilians and i always think like oh people are speaking spanish uh because it sounds so similar from a distance then you get closer and you're like i didn't i don't understand any of it and i'm like that's not oh portuguese so it's brazilian people Ooh, so you got lots of brazilian families out here uh and because of that because they get dedicated brazilian tourism in big numbers every year it was like the perfect pavilion to pull off out here give them their own pavilion like look at that brazil and so i know a lot of brazilians were excited about it like yes we're finally going to get our own pavilion um the french they couldn't have been less excited when they built this or even now i tell people in france about the epcot pavilion like oh in florida we have a little friend i show them pictures never impressed they're never impressed look at the bucanista right here Look at the little maps. Now, what you don't know is there's 900 of these boxes in Paris, 900 of them, and only about 240 vendors. So each vendor will own, like, say, multiple boxes and all that kind of stuff. These are very old-fashioned. They don't do this underneath anymore. They have bigger boxes. But they have to mostly sell books. They're only allowed. They can sell some antique stuff, like those vintage maps that you see. The reason you don't see a lot of this in those bucanese you almost never see these they're only allowed to sell a very small percentage of anything modern any kind of modern tourist stuff um and that is something that i had completely kind of forgotten about in france and i was like oh yeah isn't it this and this and this and this and looked it back up the day i was leaving france not too long ago so if you missed that we were doing sometimes vlogs in the city of paris and now here we are back in epcot paris where i had been right before the real paris and so i kept referencing epcot and now i'm back in epcot referencing the real france what is happening you see why i feel like i'm taking crazy pills a little <laughs> <laughs> they're coming to take me away haha <laughs> they're coming to take me away ha <laughs> uh, yes i'm a little bit tired so six planes in six weeks is what it's going to be the day after tomorrow when i fly away i did not know what to expect this week i didn't have time to build this trip to scale or to paint it but we did manage to pull off hello we did manage to pull off a couple of sometimes vlogs and a couple of more random land adventures than I thought we were going to pull out. We got at least three. I did a whole crazy day with Allie. I did ride the Tron light cycle. I think I have a little bit of a different take on it than a lot of other people. And I tried to, you know, tried to, tried to put it in there in a very, very diplomatic way. But I think I got a little, little bit of a different take than maybe some of the other takes of people who have ridden that. So I did ride Tron light cycle. That was a long day. And then I uh, will thank you, Becky, who hooked me up, a cast member here, who hooked me up with the cast member preview. Very unexpectedly, wasn't expecting that. And then yesterday, I did film here in the World Showcase, and all of this stuff is really lagging behind because I got invited here at the last second. Like, do you guys want to go to Disney World with us? Allie was only here for two days, and I've been here for one week. And during that week, my friends who haven't been here for three years are trying to make up for three years of lost time. So they have memberships at certain places here where they've been paying for and not using for three years so it's like we got to make the most of it so we've been going from uh place to place lounge to lounge if you catch my drift and um in between trying to ride rides and check out all the stuff they remember in orlando we went to a deep purple concert and now uh we're in the final day so it's really taken up a notch so the fact that i managed to do a lot of filming in between that really surprised even me like oh my gosh i managed to do it so we've been up late we've been out walking pounding the pavement and then just exhausted so i am worn out uh but i'm loving it i'm loving that this 10th anniversary year 2023 of random land we are really taking it up a notch now look at this 
Look at this, before people could read, before a lot of people could read Morocco, I finally got an explanation for this. The people, and maybe sometimes even some of the people in their professions couldn't read, they'd go to some sign maker, make these signs, and these signs would be all over Morocco in Arabic and in English-ish, or French-ish, uh, so that people could, uh, like businessman, that cannot be French. That looks French to me, but we have all these signs here so the illiterate could figure out what you were doing and the literate as well. And if you come in here, oh, they actually sell these. Look at that. Look at that. Boat captain. I need to come. I, want to, I really, I wonder how much these are. 50 bucks. I think they're handmade. They must, they must have to be hand, handmade or hand painted or painted off stencils or something like that. But there's still some kind of hand involved technique. They feel that way at least. Until I got out of the plastic, I couldn't tell you for sure. But I can tell you that looking at, that having made a lot of aged stuff, themed stuff now, wooden signs. I mess with a little bit of metal. I haven't done too much metal, but actually Leroy Schmaltz, the old tiki carver, his son, Christopher, um, if you go on Instagram, it's Schmaltzland or Schmaltz, Schmaltzland Creations. One of those two. He does a lot of vintage metal signs. He's a very, very talented painter. And he'll age them and stuff. And I can tell you right here that this was like hand painted on. This wasn't like pre-faded. This is faded by the sun. And the way it fades uh, tells me that those were handmade, especially at least the writing. The painting might be partially stenciled. That's still handmade. Let me tell you what. Let me, let me tell you something, Sonny. <laughs> let me tell you what I'm telling you. No, uh, <laughs> when I started wood carving, right, I always thought like, oh, it's only really handmade if you're hammer and chisel. You start using a router, that's cheating. So I started using a router, like a big power tool, to do some carving, and I went, oh my gosh. There's a, there's a whole separate set of challenges and techniques you have to learn and stuff just as much as using the hand tools to do the carving and then I realized like oh my gosh this is actually hard. like this is a whole skill in itself and I'm like yeah but I don't use this other power tool you know I would never use a dremel for example and you use a dremel for some little parts would, there's a whole skill to using the dremel that's even different than the hand carving and the routering and all that stuff and so each level each new tool each new set of skills you have look at this Moroccan house here the Fez house isn't that beautiful? You live in a hot, arid climate. They build these courtyards where you have all this shade and the beautiful fountains. This would be someone with money, obviously, who's not living in a tent or a cave or something. But that's just beautiful. And you'll see hammered out chunks of this plaster work uh, because in, uh, in a lot of schools of Arab thought, in Muslim thought, they have a thing where, see right here, where Perf nothing can be perfect but the Almighty kind of a thing. And so an artist will work on a perfect piece of art and then intentionally damage part of it. And so that nothing can come close to the Almighty but the Almighty kind of thing, which is very interesting. That was a very big influence on Mary Blair, uh, the Imagineer, and clearly it, it uh, filtered down to other Imagineers who worked on Morocco over here. It was a very, very big influence on her and that's why you see that Grand Canyon mural and the contemporary resort, the one the monorail goes through over here uh, by Magic Kingdom, there is a five-legged goat on that mural for that exact reason. It's like a little extra leg on the goat. It's not just something funny. It's not just a little funny hidden Mickey type Easter egg. Look at this though, the old brass bazaar. Now they've got all these things on the wall here that were never for sale. But you used to have, I mean, they did sell coats and stuff in here, but you used to have all these little shops in here where they sold uh, souvenirs, they did sell these cushions. They sold all kinds of Moroccan rugs. Actually, the Moroccan rug store, the big rug store was over there. That's closed up. I'm guessing it must have closed for COVID because all, even these little doorways, they're all shut. And uh, it's very, very bizarre. In the bazaar, there's nothing for sale. Now, the other day I was thinking, oh man, Chapek, just so you could stick a bar in here and sell some more booze at Epcot. But now I'm thinking a little more kindly, I'm actually giving the benefit of the doubt, I think, Perhaps it's because the program where all the foreign um, workers, because all around Epcot and the World Showcase, they would have employees or people were cast members, but people working from their, uh, the country of origin, right? So like here, you'd have people from Morocco working in Morocco and all that stuff. And they'd have a program in Morocco where they would send over the best Moroccans to work at Epcot. Um, that stopped with COVID. It's only barely restarting. I know that in France, the cast members are once again French. In Japan, the cast members are once again Japanese over in the Mitsukoshi store because they have the Japanese, um, they're doing the pearls again and all that kind of stuff. And look at this. 
telephones are back. That's a whole separate conversation we got to have at some point. But um, yeah, so there's some coming back, but I don't know about Morocco because you see this guy in the blue shirt. Yeah, regular, regular, just American cast members uh, everywhere. And then here you have the Aladdin meet and greet. I don't know if that's still going on. I meet mean, Jasmine, yeah, she must be in there. You used to be able to see through the window over here. I guess you can't anymore, but you used to be able to see, well, you can kind of see. So you used to kind of get, be able to get a peek at whether or not Jasmine was in there. Let's look, I don't think she's in there at the moment. They're not doing the photo op at the moment. But anyway, yes, that's another thing where they started to add Disney character meet and greets throughout Epcot. They added Baymax up front and they added, you know, uh, Aladdin and Jasmine over here, Snow White to Germany. More and more Disney stuff, more and more stuff for the kids to do, more and more stuff to draw people into the World Showcase. Epcot's definitely changed. It's a hive, a thriving hive of activity. Yes. And so anyway, yes, no, uh, I haven't noticed any Moroccan cast members in Morocco yet. And you can tell because when you go and talk to them, and you're not just judging by looks, you can tell when you talk to somebody because they have, or an accent, uh, you can tell when you talk to someone because they'll have a name badge that says where they're from in Morocco. So you go to France, you notice, oh, everybody's from France. Oh, there's a reason for that. They bring them over so they can represent their country. They're sort of like little ambassadors, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I can definitely see just generic Epcot uniforms and they're not the Moroccan ones. And that's another way you can tell is that a lot of these countries will have a, a uniform or a costume, cast member costume that reflects um, that country or is unique to that country's pavilion in the World Showcase. And you see like the generic multicolored ones for just a hodgepodge of flags World Showcase uh, thing or the blue one that we just saw. And that's how you kind of know like, oh, this isn't somebody from uh, one of the sponsoring countries. Because when Epcot started, these pavilions out here, or some of them, were actually sponsored by, or at least um, the other ones were at least created in partnership with different peoples in those countries, but some of them were straight up sponsored by the host country, so like Japan, uh, Norway, I know big time. Let's see, Morocco, I think is like fully, they are fully invested in like the king of, Mor king of Morocco, is that right? fully invested in the Morocco thing and its design. It had a lot of input in it. And so they'll be, they'll have programs in those countries to send people over. Um, but slowly, slowly, it's like uh, they have less and less ownership and control and Disney has taken more control. And that's why instead of those countries deciding sort of what the features or attractions would be, it's been more and more Disney characters and that's it. So Japan still very involved from what I understand. And that's why you still have the traditional Japanese drummers and you don't see like, I don't know, Mickey in a kimono or or whatever over here. I don't know, who would they have for Japan? If they were gonna put a Japanese Disney character, you got Mulan in China, who would you have for Japan? Am I spacing or has there not been? I mean, I guess you could do, you know, the big hero six. There's like from San Francisco, Tokyo hybrid. Are they really from Japan? I guess you could get away with Baymax, but then it's a little jarring because it's very traditional uh, elements of Japan they're trying to promote over here and koi ponds and different stuff like that. So would Baymax really fit over there? I don't know. So who would you, who would you put? Interesting question. And then of course we got the best country of all the countries. Although I must admit it's possible that I'm biased. America, not the best pavilion. Sorry but the best country. Actually, it is the best pavilion if you have access to parts of the pavilion that not everybody has access to. If you catch my drift, then it's awesome because right about now, I'm feeling pretty warm. I'm feeling pretty shiny. It's mostly that the you know, spray on sunscreen, even if you rub it in, it never like really dries. Then you look all glistening all day. Gross. Anyway, I needed to buy the kind that was like, not like that. Anyway, so America. And you would think that I would love America because they have the American Adventure over here, which has Mark Twain and freaking Benjamin Franklin hanging out. Two people I am fascinated with. Obviously, Mark Twain a little heavier than Benjamin Franklin, but not really. The show is so long and it takes so long to get into the show and then get a good seat and they never let you pull out a camera or film it ever, 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 which I think is a mistake because then people don't really know what's in here and then a lot of people don't go in there, but uh, yeah, I almost never go and see that show. The next time I'm here, I will not have all these lightning lane uh, access abilities. So I will not be with certain folks who have that power. And I will definitely be back to uh, normal. I'll have to get park reservations. I'll have to hoof it and be on the beat and on the street like everybody else, like the peasant that I am. 
And uh, when I'm back like that, I plan on doing a lot more uh, different things that I haven't done in a long time, like doing American Adventure or going and checking out the inside of restaurants, maybe doing the Beauty and the Beast restaurant over there in um, Magic Kingdom, which I have eaten at before. I think I filmed... Some of you might know. Some of you go way back with me. And believe me, I appreciate you. Um, I think I filmed, like, the Beast part of it. I think I threw some clips in it. Sometimes vlog or something. But it's been a long time since I've been over there. And I don't think, still to this day, Ali's ever been over there. So, hey, stuff well, like that, that, okay. you know, we're like, eh, we don't have time. We're not ah! Okay, well, you guys know me. Well, maybe you don't. My name is Justin Scard from Random Land. Scard, not scared. The band was called Scard, and that's where the name comes from. Anyways, you know me. I've gone and filmed Death Valley in a modern record-breaking heat wave. I've trudged through Florida and deserts all over the, the country. And, uh, you know, I know a thing or two about heat. Let's put it that way. And just now, this camera overheated, and I have never touched a camera or a battery that ever felt so much like it was going to explode in my hand as this one just now. So I had to quickly run over to Germany. Well, I was thinking if it does this to a camera, what's the sun been doing to me? I told you the heat went up an extra notch over here in Walt Disney World. Anyway, we are now, I came backwards a little bit to head back to Italy and here we are. But I realized we really got to pick up the pace because it is too furiously hot. I don't want that interruption again. And I realized I was running on at the mouth as I tend to do. It's sort of my, my skill, my one nature, my one true calling. Over here, we got the whistling uh, dude. We got the mime guy over here. What's he doing? Let's see what he's doing really quick. Oh, I'm glad this guy's back. I'm glad that COVID didn't get rid of this dude. Look at him. Here we go. Ooh. I thought he was tossing at me for a second. I was a little bit worried. Yay, we caught something in the net. Oh, throw it. I just love how expressive this guy can be with just a whistle. And he really can be too. Look at this. Oh, oh, oh. Try again. For a second, I was thinking of the acrobats. The acrobats are over in France. They climb up the chairs and all that kind of stuff. But this guy, the little mime dude, it's very entertaining. If you ever spot him out here, definitely give him a chance. Give him your attention, since that's the only patronage, hello, that you can uh, that you can sort of give them. I don't think you're allowed to tip. Are you allowed to tip those guys? I don't think so. I mean, nobody does. Maybe you are allowed, I don't know. Anyway, uh, who would have thought the Germans would be saving Americans, huh? They went over there and thought, what is this heat doing to me if it's doing that to the camera? Uh, and I uh, downed a Power aid really quickly. Mostly because it's still morning. I haven't eaten yet, and I just really wanted some sugar along with my electrolytes and everything. Dude, I quit drinking sugar. I lost like 70 pounds, right? Lost like 70 pounds by quitting drinking sugar. Uh, I'm not supposed to do strenuous exercises because of my heart thing, right? So I, I quit drinking sugar. I made all the calorie adjustments I could. I lost like 70 pounds. I gained like 10 of it back. Um, and I was doing so good. Then I came here. My friends have been taking me all these places here that have very sugary like mocktails and they're so good they are so good i can't help it i've completely undone my whole sugar-free thing on this trip i've been drinking power aid like sugar full power aid and all i mean occasionally i'm drinking a coke zero look i got coke zero and two seconds later i'm drinking power aid i'm drinking everything else i'm like oh no i've blown it so i i probably hacked on a little bit oh look at this look at this we're sneaking up we're sneaking up. We're sneaking. That's a sick hat, bro. Oh, <laughs> hey. What's up? Doing? That's so weird. I didn't know if you saw me right now or not, but I was like, look at this. We're sneaking <laughs> up on that. What's your name again? Tommy. 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 That's right. Tommy yeah, and Melissa. Yeah. Nice to see you guys again. That's a sick <laughs> lid. I like that. Yeah, look, this is where I came for refuge over here. See, it's like a kindred spirit hat. It's not like there's a fan. It's like there's a fan of adventure and love and quest for positivity. Look at, oh. This is where I was, seeking shelter in Germany over here. I wanted to show you something really quick. Even if we don't make it all the way around the world, at least we made it to Germany, everybody's favorite country. One, check this out. Check out all the wood carving tools over in this little area at Kidcot. The whole time I've been coming here, this has been a Kidcot area. But now I'm noticing those are actual chisels and gouges. And if you have gouges and not just chisels, then they're not just props. And you've got new and old mallets and pieces of wood ready to carve. And you got some other ones that are obviously props like that. They're not, they're not, what are they planing out here, you know? 
but look at that. So there must have been actual, in real time, German wood carving right there at one point. There's a lot of carved wood stuff in here. Now that's just me and my nerdy little, I got really into wood carving, so I'm just noticing all that stuff. They have the cuckoo clocks, of course. Not as many as they used to have. They must be selling out. But this, this is what I noticed. Look at this portrait of this guy. It's a very particularly placed. Who is that? I am sure that is some kind of German author, poet, maybe. Maybe some great leader of who knows where, of Schnitzel, Bergen. But I have no idea who it is. And I started thinking, I kind of prefer it that way. So to me, this is just Herr Klaus. Jawohl, Herr Klaus. So if you're ever coming through Germany, say hello to Herr Klaus. Also, I noticed over here, look at this really quick, just really quick. Sorry. <laughs> They've got this sick. I don't usually care about ornaments and weird fancy things. They got this sick piece of merch over here. It's that Snow White box that the hunter is supposed to put her heart in. That's, a, that's like a horror movie prop right there. And look what comes inside of it. A poisoned apple ornament. Now, look at guys. I'm a pretty manly sort of a sort of a guy. I wear cool. Oh, sorry. I wear cool black stuff, and I got a van down by the river. I'm pretty tough. This guy knows. He's got a beard. He, me and him, we hunt for boar. But uh, I gotta tell you, that is a cool, sick piece of merch. I would buy that piece of princess merch. Hey, how's it going, man? Oh my gosh. <laughs> What's your name? I'm Darius. Hey, nice to meet oh you, dude. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Oh, let's get a sick pig. Oh sick my gosh. Sick pig. Hey, Joe. Joe. Oh, Who's Charles? No. Ah, Darius, sick pig. Oh my ah. gosh, this is like, ah. this is the greatest You're on the Sometimes vlog right now, is that okay? Oh yeah. Okay, I'm just absolutely. making sure. Hey, oh what's up, you? What's your name? Alex. Hey, nice. Alex, you gotta get the fist bump. You gotta stop jumping. Boom! Nailed it! Okay, we're right, gonna can we look this way. You are very tall in real life. Well, I'm only this big on a phone. <laughs> Alex! Oh, Alex. 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 That's Thank awesome! It's so, so nice to meet you guys! Oh, Guten Tag! <laughs> look at that. Got some friends out there. I want to show you this too. You guys remember the pickle tree? It's a whole thing. I filmed this whole pickle tree thing, this German pickle tree. And by the way, I bought one of these pickle ornaments and then all the people I've ever met from Germany are like, Wie don't you this? The pickle? What? They think we made it up. But they have a new ornament out here. If you're not into pickles, you can buy a COVID ornament to remember the good times. Co can you say COVID on YouTube still? Uh-oh, we just got in trouble. That was awesome, dude. It's cool running into people who are like, it feels like running into family, to be honest with you. It feels like running into family and you're like, hey, what's up? Give the fist bump, give a hug, take a sick pic, walk around, do your thing, enjoy your trip. Pretty awesome. Anyway, look at this Werther's Original store over here. I don't see Werther's Original on it anymore. Is it no longer a Werther's Original store in there? There's a little bakery in here. Or am I mixing up where the Werther's spot was? They just uh, sought refuge in Germany to cool down. I didn't see any Werther's stuff in there. And they filmed one of their commercials there, so I don't know what's going on with that. See, look, see what I'm talking about? There's Snow White back there doing her thing meeting and greeting Germans. That real story is very dark. Actually, even the Walt Disney version is pretty darn dark with the hunter. His job is to take her out to the forest, cut her open with a dagger that the, excuse me, whoo, that the evil queen gave to him and bring back her heart in a box. So he brings back a boar's heart in, I mean, he doesn't cut her heart out, good for him, but in the children's film, he cuts out an animal's heart and brings it to her in the box and she's convinced so she clearly i guess it's obviously her first time look at here's the africa area i was talking about over here and uh looks like generic cast members over on yonder but they still have a few african cast members over here oh they're doing beadwork sometimes you have people out here doing wood carving wow look at this fine 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 beadwork over here and you'll see people hand making it out here just like you see them doing oh they're doing the wood carving too look at hand carving these canes let's see 155.99 a stick with a monkey yes because it takes a lot of work to carve wood and sometimes i'll do these like for me elaborate carvings and i'll do the, these crazy carvings and people will be like i don't know you're asking 200 for that car like yes it took me two weeks to carve or something like that you know it's not like uh, just carving that sometimes some are some are easy some are very very hard and something like this 
it's not even how long it takes that dude because i've seen that dude crank them out but it's how much skill is involved and how much time he had to invest in training and learning that skill over years and years and years and building those shapes in his head and it's a skill that i mean you're probably not going to be able to grab this guy right here and go hey carve me a monkey on a stick probably not going to be able to do it anyway the refreshment outpost so there is sort of a little african themed area kind of i love this old coke truck right here look at that this old chevy truck how about that awesome i'd love to own something like that from one of the parks like there used to be a truck like that in adventureland in california in the 90s i would love to own that it's like an old maybe a model t i can't really remember and i'm not super um car guy from back then but uh i think it was a model t truck maybe a model a and they have this truck out there in adventureland themed to all the stuff it would be cool to find that and own that drive that around like a drive around the adventureland truck actually we we're just talking today about the buses that used to go around the world showcase the world showcase buses very similar to the double decker omnibuses in disneyland also designed by my friend bob Gurr. so we were talking about those yesterday and i was talking about how one of them recently sold nobody knew it was here in Kissimmee. it was close by it was in a place where you could kind of go and check it out they had sold it to like a local restaurant or bar or something like that um and then that place sold it kind of off the radar not a big auction or anything like that sold look at china china chickadee china that's all i can ever think of because the song in the 90s right chickadee china the chinese chicken there's so many other parts of that song the finest of the flavors all that but that part is the part that always right in my brain every time i see china or someone talks about china and my it's not my fault it's mtv's fault in the 90s chickadee china the chinese chicken have a drumstick in your brain starts clicking anyway what the heck was i talking about i have no idea i do not remember <laughs> we're almost we're almost through the world showcase we've almost made it uh, what were we talking about germany africa oh i was saying i would love to get that double decker bus it'd be cool if i could have swooped in and got it for a sick price fixed it up and done like travel around the country in the epcot bus i'm guessing it would have cost a lot in fuel and had a pretty slow speed limit but how sick would that be if random land acquired one of the epcot world showcase buses and then we bust ourselves around the i mean that's basically what i did this summer just with a big old clunky old breaking down every five minutes van that was a fun one everyone's like you taking the van out this summer i really hope so that is going to depend on how many people i can meet who are like i can hook you up by looking at the van tell you what you need mechanically get under the hood because it's just it needs to be gone over by one of those grease monkeys that really enjoys like digging into problems and all that kind of stuff getting dirty and uh wiring things and checking it. i need someone who really knows and i've taken it to lots of shops and the shops are trying to get it out of there so they can get more cars in it's not like the same thing as having a buddy who's going to thoroughly go over the car uh, with the amount of time and attention they can't really give you at the kind of shop that i know how to find or walk into or afford more importantly look at this we got a little music going on here we're gonna sing for you, okay? I mean, it wasn't celebrating a birthday. Oh, I mean, who is? Anybody else? Birthdays, but what? Happy birthday! I want to stand right in the sun. We're gonna overheat the camera again. Bye. We're celebrating Ali's birthday. Anybody else? Birthdays, birthdays, birthdays. I don't want to say. Somebody's birthday. I want to tell him it's my birthday and stand okay, up there, but then I don't want the camera to overheat. We're gonna celebrate together. We're gonna sing a Hurry up! Hurry up! Hurry up. We, get, right, we promised the song here. Free bird. People would always say that stuff to me. And then after that, help us sing nice and loud. Happy birthday. Okay. Can you guys hear that? This guy knows the words. He's singing along. I don't know these songs. Okay, we gotta move along. We gotta make it around the world. We are in our final country. Now we have reached our final destination. Not like the film. Hopefully no logs will fall on us. No roller coasters will break or anything like that. We've got Sombrero Donald back there or as Party City calls a sombrero, a Mexican large head, Donald over here. Look at it, he's signing autographs. He has always got a long line. I have never in all these years taken this photo with Donald because the line is, I mean, that's not too bad. But when you're walking around World Showcase, if you just started in Mexico, you're thinking, I got a long way to go. And if you're just ending in Mexico, I'm tired. I don't know if I want to stop and stay in the line. I need my forward momentum. And I've got a long day ahead of me. I'm actually headed right now 
all the way out to the front of Epcot and then to uh, the monorail way over to Magic Kingdom where I meet the rest of my party who are leaving tomorrow and I leave the following day. Um, which will mean nothing by the time you see this. And I have all those videos I was gonna tell you earlier. I have all those videos from Disney World. None of them are edited. None of them are completely edited because I was editing Super Mario Town. I went to Universal Studios Hollywood and the uh, Super Nintendo Town that opened over, Super Nintendo World that opened over there with the Mario Kart ride and all that. And got to film that right before opening day in California. And I was just editing that video as I landed here in those first couple of days. So I have been editing uh, videos from here, but it is likely it's well, I'm at the point now where it's like I have so little time I need to spend every second With them doing the stuff doing the last stuff they're trying to do they're trying to close out the trip and all that stuff and Filming so I would I think you know in my head instead of spending the two hours in the hotel doing a little bit of extra editing uh, I thought it's probably better to come down hang out with you guys wander all the way around the world get super super hot overheat the camera overheat my brain and uh, have a good time. So, we're gonna close out over here where we started in just a few seconds. First, we're gonna visit three of these guys' friends over here. We're going to visit, oh, a bride. Look at that. We're gonna visit the three caballeros. Ah. Jose, Panchito, Donaldo. Look at these guys. Yeah. And then head on back to the end. It's been a crazy couple of years. A depressing, stressful, frustrating, horrible couple of years. And uh, like I said, you know, like I was an early, uh, early one of the people on the ground doing this kind of stuff here, the filming and the parks and all that kind of stuff. And so to sort of like be at the forefront and then knock back with COVID and all stuff and then alley surgeries and all the things that happened and just be sort of, just sort of knocked out of my own routine, knocked out of all this stuff. It was difficult, but like I was talking about the other day, can't always control your circumstances, but you can sometimes control your reaction to them. And so I did, I followed my own quest for positivity. Uh, never advice, I'm never giving anyone else advice, but I followed my own previous advice to myself, my own what worked for me previously. And uh, really sort of reinvested in the quest for positivity, the trying to practice gratefulness, the trying to see the silver lining in everything. And uh, See, like instead of getting all fresh, like, oh, the videos aren't coming out, blah, 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 all this stuff like right now, just trying to put my mind into like, you know what? Daryl's time. The videos will come out when they come out. I can only control, I can't control the circumstances of the trip and all the crazy stuff, but I can control the fact that, you know what? I can prioritize filming, creating adventures, hanging out with you guys, and this gives us an opportunity to do a little extra sometimes. We're still building it back up, baby. We're building it back up, building it back up to full strength, to full wackiness, to full bluster. I'm still getting used to this camera equipment. I didn't know it was gonna overheat right there. That is useful knowledge. And hopefully the sometimes vlogs won't always be this long. But uh, in this particular case, I was like, oh, you know, I should do like a 20 minute one today. But then I thought, or, <laughs> or we could go all the way around the world and see goofy and weird cloudy Epcot silhouetted light. What happened? Now it gets cloudy? Oh sure, now it gets cloudy. Well, at least the view was beautiful for us. Uh, as we started this trip, as we started this trip around the world, bless you. Uh, and now it's a little gloomier, but oh my gosh, I cannot believe this, you guys. The monorail is coming in to, I just saw it by Spaceship Earth. We can literally end this vlog where we began it, how we began it in a second. This is gonna be trippy. We've gone all the way around the world together and now we are back to the beginning. It's like it never even happened, but I'm glad it did. And I'm super grateful that you guys were here with me to enjoy it, to be part of it. Please make sure you're still subscribed to Random Land. Please make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. I really enjoy, I have really enjoyed the past 10 years of hanging out with you guys. It has meant a lot to me without your support, without the people on Patreon, without uh, people realizing, you know, all the crazy adventures and being part of the quest for positivity and uh, a kindred spirits there is no way this ever could have happened and definitely no way it could ever, ever continue. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Please check out the links below in the description. Uh, and you've done your duty. You can go home and sleep well. I may see you from Disney World again. I may not see you from Disney World again for a while, but we will be having more adventures coming 
right up. So from me, Justin Scard, remember there's two R's in there, Justin Scard from Epcot, from Walt Disney World, I am now signing off. Farewell. Sayonara. Auf Wiedersehen. Au revoir.